Wales, two in Taylor of Wensfield, who was a saddler, of two mess ridges, formerly to be three, fronting to the south side of the high street, and bounded on the north by the towing path of the Worley and Essington Canal. And it measured 632 square yards, and very kindly they gave us a sketch. <laughs> so there's the Worley and Essington, you can see the towing path underneath it. The piece of land is the peat bit. There's the high street, basically, so you can probably locate that fairly easily. I mean, I'm taking it that we're at the point where, like, the dog and partridge is about mm -hmm. here. That says Pinfold, so it would have been the fold, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. the Pinfold Bridge. Um, yeah, ooh, I've made it wobble, never mind. <laughs> There's the Lichfield Road going off up there. <clears throat> I'm going to take you through an argument in the 1530s. <laughs> a dispute arose, uh, got a bit physical, between two families concerning land in Wensfield. They were the Loosens, the top Leesons, pronounced Loosens back then. They owned land in a lot a lot of Wensfield, of Wolverhampton, of Willinor, and the senior branch of the family owned Lillishall, they owned Trenton, and they eventually, through marriages, got merged into the family of the Dukes of Sutherland, which is why the Dukes of Sutherland ended up being owners of a lot of local land, because the land went with the marriage. Um, they were important folk in the area, so it could have been a bit manipulative. The other family were the Wilkeses, poorer, less influential people. Um, they could have been out for what they could get, and they might have been sold out by a younger sibling. We'll see that in a minute. Right, sometime just before we started to have church records to refer to. Richard Wilkes married his wife Agnes, somebody or other. And they had children. They had an elder son, John. They had a second son, also a Richard. And then two other children who were just sort of mentioned casually. Their names aren't given. And Richard died at the end of 1536. And then a dispute arose over land that had formerly been his and now John Lewis was cracking in it. This is the situation according to John Lewis. He says Richard Wilkes, the father, had two tenements, two gardens, and 16 acres of land. He transferred all that to his son Richard. So this is his second son, so it would have been a bit unusual by various methods because it was held by him under different sorts of sets of conditions. Richard, the son, took the profits of it for about the last two years of his father's life. And later, Richard the son surrendered the land to the Dean's Court yeah. to the use of myself, Lucen, and also in fee for two tenements and gardens to me forever. <laughs> Therefore, I was seized at the various premises until John Wilkes, so this is the oldest brother of Richard, the older son of the deceased Mr Wilkes, and others entered the premises by force of arms. Consequently, John Wilkes and others were indicted for forcible entry and a warrant of good abearing was issued as good behaviour. And he goes on to say the warrant went to the constable, Robert Moll, I keep saying Richard Moll, <laughs> Robert Moll, who went to the premises and I went along with him with some others. And John Wilkes made restless of forcible resistance during which he shot some arrows, one of which saw wounded one Richard Ridley, and then he disappeared over the hedge, apparently still shooting arrows. <laughs> you weren't allowed to shoot arrows back then. Um, the warrant has still not been sued because John Wilkes doth lurk and hide himself in secret places and woods and will not be instified by the law. So we must have had secret places and woods back in the 1530s. Lewis put forward a few rest, uh, witnesses to support his version of events who testified to the transfer of the property. So in summary he said, Richard Brooks, the father, once held the land. He made them over to his younger son Richard. Richard held them for two or three years without challenge. Then he gave them to me. So John Wilkes and his mother Agnes by now are illegally occupying my property. Oh dear. The situation, according to John Wilkes, is rather complicated and lengthy. After my death, I made homage at the Manor Court at Wolverhampton and was admitted tenant to all of the property on 
the Tuesday after the feast of St. Hilary, the 28th year of the reign of King Henry VIII, which is the 13th of January, 1537 to you and me. Um, my brother Richard only took the profits on our father's sufferance, and then a false indictment was laid against me and shown in my absence, so I got no chance to respond. And the JP whose name he was issued in later told me he knew nothing about it. <laughs> John Lucy, with five or six others, came to one of the tenements to chuck out me and my aged mother. They chased me over several hedges, and I was so afraid for my life, I shot arrows in the direction of Richard Ridley, who is, quote, my mortal enemy, as he tried to shoot him in Stafford. <laughs> At John Lucy's request, the matter was put to the hearing of Sir John Shepherd. Yeah. We all went over to Broome to see him, but Lucent left when he saw the number of witnesses I brought with me. Lucent's kinsman, Worley, later sent for me to come to, now this is annoying, a particular alehouse in Wensfield. Why couldn't you have said what it was called? Like the Duck and Partridge or something? You probably are, you? <laughs> <laughs> Where he told me to leave possession of the premises, I refused and Worley left. Agnes, mother of John, says, Oh, she stood accused of the unlawful seizure of fruits from an orchard, but she said she was entitled to a third of the fruits as her dowry because her husband had now deceased so she could reclaim her dowry portion. Agnes also said that during the forcible entry by Lucen and his gang, she was thrown down the stairs. So in summary, Mr Wilkes is saying Richard was once in possession of disputed premises. It's the only thing they agree on. Um, he did not make them over to my brother Richard. I was lawfully, officially admitted tenant to the Dean, which you would think would be easy to prove because it's a matter of court record. Um, John Lucen illegally and forcibly attempted to oust myself and my mother, and I'm the lawful occupier. So, what actually happened? Uh, I have to tell you, I cannot find a resolution to this, but. <laughs> I picked this case up from Small Shire's 1978 book yeah. and thought I'd go off and investigate it myself, so I bought the documents to do with the actual arguments back and forth in the court and the witness statements. I bought them from the National Archives. Um, Small Shire says the case was found in favour of Lucent, but was it? Um, the National Archives have told me that there are no Star Chamber judgments that survived for that period. But they could have been mentioned in any other document, like a letter between two people. Um, and there is an item, anyway, in small, I'm going to try and chase that up, but in small side, that's of interest to that, where he says that Thomas Cromwell, so this is Henry VIII's minister from 1532 to his execution in 1540, had written to both Sir Anthony Fitzherbert and Sir John Talbot about the problem of the Lucens, who seemed to have tricked honest yeomen of their farms and thrived on rights and unlawful assemblies in the hope of monetary gain. So he asked these knights of Staffordshire, that's Fitzherbert and Talbot, take pains for my sake that the truth therein may thoroughly appear according to the trust and expectation that the King's Highness has in you these things you want, and the next chapter is, and it's not there. It's really annoying. But these things have a habit of popping out when you're doing a blanket search over a number of other documents that it's got nothing to do with the thing you're looking for. Somehow there's an incidental mention. But it is really, really annoying. And a couple <coughs> of quills from the 1500s. So 25th of May, 1555, a chap called Thomas Wood of Wensfield wrote his will saying, being sick in my body and whole and perfect of memory, make my testament and last will. And he must have been proved because it was proved the following January. Um, now, to his godchildren, uh, of which there were quite a few and they all looked like nephews and nieces, he left a combined total of £20, six and eightpence. You'll see a lot of six and eightpences and thirteen and fourpences. That's because he actually left the bequests in marks but I converted it to pounds just so you can understand it better. He had a pile of other nieces and nephews, and between them got thirty-eight pounds, six and eight pounds. It doesn't look like he had any children, or no surviving children anyway. To his own brothers and sisters, seventeen pounds, thirteen and four months. To his mother, he left ten pounds, and she to meddle with nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> 
So every house servant, and I've just assumed four because I haven't got a clue, but he left a pound, which was a lot, so there's four pound there. Um, a few named requests to other individuals, which came to £12.6, £3 pound to Roger Allen's wife. I'm not quite sure what Roger Allen's wife deserved, but <laughs> obviously Comforts. he owed her three pounds. <laughs> You'll see in a minute. <laughs> and then randomly, three pounds six nine to John Hall, who's living in London with a barber in Milk Street. <laughs> I mean, Milk Street's still there, but it's, it's all sort of concrete and glass business places now. Um, I don't know why he was, I mean, but that was the only address he had in order to make sure the bequest got to him. And then to the poor of Wensfield and the neighbouring parishes, he left arms to the value of £12.13 and um, 1555, we've gone into the time of Queen Mary, Bloody Mary, so he swung back from Protestantism to Catholicism, so hence he doesn't mind leaving money for an altar cloth to the high altar, which is a Catholic. Thing. And to Joe and his wife, he actually left 100 marks, which comes down to £66.13 and £4. He also left uh, his goods, his chattels, his money, his plates, his crops, his wains, his clothes, his harrows, some cattle, some sheep and some horses. I've tried very hard to work out what that might be worth, and I've seen everything from practically zilch to billionaire type status. So I haven't tried to quantify it because it would be, well, it just wouldn't be right. But in total cash, he left £192.68. This is 450 years ago, 460 years ago. And if all those other things weren't particularly of good value, he's still going to be £20, I would have thought. So he's going to have left £200. That's a lot of clock in cash, that is. But he was quite clear in his mind about his will being carried out, because he said, if any of my executors alter any point or clause contained in this my last will and testament, and do hinder any point or clause in the same, all such legacies as I have given him or them, his or theirs that so shall alter, to be void and of non effect, and also to be put out of their executorship. So he was obviously expecting a lot of arguments about where his cash was going. <laughs> um, Thomas doesn't mention a house or land. So probably he must have held them under some other, um, a landlord must have held them because he didn't mention he'd been left to his wife. So there had to be something somewhere, it's not in his will anyway. And then, very quickly, 3rd of November 1566, Thomas Allen of Wensville, a neighbour, being by thank our Lord God in good health and whole and perfect of memory, do make this my last will and testament. Now, he must have been okay because he didn't get proved till 16 years later, so he obviously lived a while. Not so much money. He named a few uh, bequests to family and friends, came to £6.5 shillings. He said, every servant in my service at my deceased, two shillings. I assume that he's a neighbour. He's probably got apprentices, so, you know, there might have been somebody in the house and four apprentices, so I just estimated 10 shillings, 50 pence down. <laughs> um, Thomas and Edward, sons of Roger Allen, whose wife got £3 under the last will, <laughs> and George Tonks, son of Humphrey Tonks, my brother-in-law. <laughs> All manner of tools I have in the blacksmithy and the nail smithy. Bellows, stiddies, hammers, balls, tongs, all manner of other tools that I have in both smithies, to be parted by indifferent men. And if Thomas, Edward and George cannot agree to work together, my will is that all manner of tools before named be parted by a lot as much as one to the other. So in other words, if you can't sort yourselves out, you'll just get a random selection and that'll be your fault. <laughs> so somebody else expecting a bit of argument. Um, to Joe and my wife, all the rest of my goods, be that whatever they may. Um, but he does mention land strangely, so I leave my land free and my tenements and other land customary, so that's held by copy. Strange expression, from six years, and from six years to six years, to the end of 18 years after my decease. So, he's leaving in six year blocks, in three blocks of six year. Now, whether when he made that will, he didn't alter the will. It doesn't look altered, it looks like the original copy. But it depends what he died of. I mean, if he died of old age, then presumably Joni's wife was not going to be long mm -hmm. behind him. So I'm not quite sure what the idea is there. 
Um, I have asked somebody who claimed to be an expert on this and they haven't got a clue, but it's not the first time I've seen that. Um, but anyway, the point is Jo was looked after for the rest of her life. And he also confesses that I, Thomas Allen, owe to the five children of Roger Allen, my brother, the sum of five pounds. Um, and that money is now 